thought about how we can monitor, how we can um, to see how the research is impacts in all the policy. So therefore, we started a study. Can I have the next slide, please? So we started a project of how can we monitor impact on research. The goal of the project is, first of all, showcasing the input and output, but also uh, outcome and impact of all our studies. And therefore, we need a clear methodology for tool for self-assessment. We want to do it ourselves to see how can we monitor the impact. Why? There are a lot. It's nice to know what's the impact, but there is more than that. It's also for policy learning and growing the evaluation culture within, within our departments and also public responsibility. And uh, we, we get a lot of parliamentary questions about all the research that is done. And so we want to yeah, know how we can answer those. But uh, important to indicate that the project is still ongoing, so not yet finished. So I'm here to still tell about uh, yeah, the, the things we have so far. Next. So important to indicate that is that um, when you try to monitor uh, the impact, you need to indicate some impact pathways. That's one we found in every literature we, found, we read, we've read. Um, so you have the sphere of control where you have the direct impact. Um, it's a, in fact the output you see when you have your, your research is done, you, you deliver a report and you give it to everyone. That's the direct sphere of control. Then you have the sphere of influence that's somehow um, more difficult. That's where you have some knowledge enhancements and where you have uh, evidence informed policy more of yeah, it's, it's a higher level, but then at the end, you have the sphere of interest, your ultimate goal of your research, and that is to raise the quality of the living environment. But that's really difficult to, to interpret and to see, especially within our department, I have to indicate. Um, as said before, we are a new department merging of two, two former departments, and it's still difficult for us to, to identify what is the living environment. <laughs> so it's not just um yeah environment and spatial planning it's more than a lot comes together it's like all the layers all the flows in the, the air the soil the deep ground so it's really difficult <laughs> the next one please uh yeah so for indicators for the throughput of the conditions um of the impact and you read you have you have to indicate two types you have the direct throughputs, but also the conditions of your research. For example, some are here uh, on the screen, but for example, you can have, um, you can monitor the impact uh, of your research by, by seeking how the, the output is, is measured and is, in, is accessible in databases and is, is um, uh, used before, but you have to also consider that the quality of your report is important so you can see how it's not because your report is not uh, is in a database that it is a good report. So you have to see as well. The same for um, when you go to the politics, um, you cannot say, oh, it's not a good report because none of, none of the politicians used it, but maybe it's because you're focusing on the wrong stakeholders. So that's all the difference you have to make. Um, I have to go quickly, I think, so next one. <laughs> The final results, there are also some needs and requirements um, that you need to consider when you make an, uh, a monitoring scheme for, for uh, monitoring the impact of your research. There your, we have to see that there are differences on the why. Is it just for accountability of the spending on the research, but it's also for learning and following through of, uh, and the policy learning and everything else. So do you focus on intermediary outcome? or really the impact, but maybe that's not possible as said before. And then you have the research programs or thematic clusters and all those differences you have to, to take in account. Quick um, overview. <laughs> Thank you, Helena. Um, so I'm, I'm briefly gonna recap my introduction because apparently online they could not hear any of the introduction and only halfway through your presentation they got connected sound-wise. Um, so just to recap that this workshop is to uh, investigate how we can deliver scientific evidence 
quickly, fast, when society asks for it, to policymakers and how policymakers and scientists can work together. And Helena dis discussed a case study on uh, a monitoring uh, tool uh, within the Flemish government. So if I open <laughs> with questions, so how do you manage to consider all the needs and requirements for a good monitor? Yeah, there are a lot of needs and maybe not all of them are already told, but uh, I think it's important to prioritize them. And therefore we, we, we made a committing steer, uh, steering committee uh, to talk about and, and to see even what is the most important because not everything is possible in the monitoring. And uh, that's that um, the most important is to focus on all the levels of the politics uh, that's involved and also on all the thematics. So that's the most important prioritized. Okay, and then how do you analyze and in the next step interpret the results? Yeah, that is also, uh, that will be difficult. <laughs> Therefore, we will start doing it ourselves. We want to the, the, the tool to be self-assessments um, because at Flemish level, you also have to consider all the different political games that are, uh, yeah, that are in, the, in the political fields. So, um, we will start doing it ourselves and then we will improve the, the, the methods. And then we afterwards we will communicate open about it. So we will try to, to do it ourselves in first. Okay. Um, maybe in view of the time, are there any questions either online or in the room? No. no. So, so in a typical monitor, you do that frequently? To, to look in time, because that often, at least in my scientific view, then shows the evidence for the monitor. So how are you planning to do that? Yeah, we will try to do it annually, or maybe three, four, five years, annual, uh, per four or five years, uh, depending on the thematics and on the programs. But uh, yeah, we will try to do it frequently and also to adjust the, the monitor and how yeah, learning by doing clear yeah and and so you already touched upon the specifics for the flemish government and the flemish politics i'm sure there's politics everywhere um so can can other countries learn or the eu learn from this monitor and how can that be adapted to be used wider i think so i hope so um we will also it's because it's a outsourced research project uh, there will be a real good manually um guideline to use so maybe because we have our specific thematics but maybe the, the procedure itself can be implemented for everyone and we hope others will read it and then they can give feedback to us so we can learn of them as well clear no online questions no online questions Okay, so then thank you Helena and then we continue I'll I'll give the floor to the next moderator Yatje Thanks a lot. Thanks, Elena. Thanks, Monique. And uh, so I, I'm Jacek Kronowski. I'm a president of the Young Academy Science Advice Structure and also a head of the Polish Young Academy. And I have a great pleasure now to uh, introduce to you uh, Jako Kusmanen, uh, who uh, is here with us from the Finnish Academy of Sciences Lettres. And uh, uh, we are going to hear about the uh, science policy interaction and policy drafting by the red teams is a very interesting approach uh, which they uh, experiment with. And I would like to encourage you after this presentation to, uh, to ask uh, questions to, to Jako, we'll have a short session of uh, Q&A and then we'll move on to the next speaker. So Jako, floor is yours. Thank you, Jack. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here with you this morning. So basically, um, I'm going to give you a very, very short introduction of an experimental model of science advice that we've been developing in Finland, which is the use of scientific red teams in policy drafting. So for those of you who you don't know, red teaming is basically a concept that is utilized, for example, in foresight, uh, in intelligence community and in cybersecurity. So basically, uh, one team, uh, which is called usually called the white team, is building a product, building a hypothesis, building a claim about intelligence, and then the red team comes in and tries to test the tenacity, the functionality of the product, the validity of the claim made in the intelligence, for example. So it's a dialogical back and forth between two, two communities. And so next slide, please. 
So um, this work builds on uh, a science advice development initiative that we had in Finland, which was a three-year initiative called SOFI, funded by the government, where we're tr developing through experimental methods these type of new models. Uh, our, one of our plan was to create a permanent uh, science policy platform in Finland, a new new platform, and we were successful enough so that uh, in, from the beginning of this year, we got a permanent grant from the Finnish Academy of Science and Letters. So we work as the Finnish Academy of Science and Letters in the future, uh, trying to uh, operate these new models and then develop also uh, newer models. So um, until the stock market breaks down or the third world war comes, so we're, we're permanent. So, uh, but so basically, um, so if next slide, please. So we started off by uh, interviewing about 300 civil servants, politicians, uh, researchers, uh, uh, rectors, etc., to try to understand what's missing from the Finnish ecosystem. And something that we found quite repetitively was that the idea that the kind of rigid science advice operating models that are built around a very kind of question and answer logic are not sufficient for complex policy topics. So basically, um, the commissioned reports, expert hearings, expert statements are all important parts of evidence in court policy, but at the same time, especially for kind of interconnected complex issues, something new is needed as well. So basically, all of these models lead to a mosaic of evidence, but you still need to provide uh, to produce the kind of positive proposals, the claims about policy. And in there, basically, if you look at it from the lens of evidence, these kind of interconnected issues, basically, there's an infinite amount of evidence that you could utilize in these uh, proposals, right? So we wanted to turn things around. And uh, instead of operating so that the government comes in with a question and then the scientists try to answer in the light of best available evidence, the government comes in with a proposal, a claim, uh, a, a draft, an early draft about what they want to do, an early draft about impact assessment, an early draft about uh, the state of play, the challenge definitions, and then the scientific team tries to break that apart and analyze that. So um, next slide, please. So we're basically, it's kind of an explorative dialogic space for policy drafters and scientists. And uh, one thing that we want to do is, uh, is, is exactly to test early hypothesis on policy drafting by utilizing insights from scientists. And I'm saying insights because it's quite often much more than simply producing best available evidence as you know, the previous speaker as well mentioned. So there, there's a lot going on in policy drafting and also like, humanities and social sciences are important parts. So for example, we're doing a, a national climate adaptation plan. And so there's a need for definition of vulnerability there. So definition of vulnerability requires philosophers, ethicists, uh, social anthropologists, uh, lawyers, uh, legal experts, uh, economists who know then how to quantify the idea of vulnerability and so on and so on. So, so these type of things are, uh, are needed. So that's why we want to bring early dialogues with the drafters. So we have a, a, a draft of the vulnerability definition, for example, then we bring in team to try to analyze that and how to make it even better. So depending on the mandate, there can be also involved like co-designing of pathways forward in policy drafting. So the team can also help them if they get a mandate from the government to, to support the, uh, developing the pathways forward. So next slide, please. So basically what we do is usually it's about five to six civil servants. So we're, I'm emphasizing here the term civil servants because what we're doing is we're working with civil servants and leaving politics outside. So the whole team from the side of the policy drafters are also interested in finding the best available evidence, best uh, definitions. So, and then there's the scientific team, which is usually about five to 10 people as well. We do about one to three workshops between one to two to three, four hours. Um, there's outcome documents that then are come out of the process. We've used it in things like challenge definition of trying to understand if the government analysis about state of play is correct. Uh, policy objectives, are the objectives achievable? Uh, are the means and the, the objectives in a reasonable connection to each other? Uh, is the ex ante impact assessment done in, in satisfactory way? Uh, also meta level analysis about the impact assessment frameworks and tools that are utilized by governments. So a lot of these things like impact assessment on climate adaptation is still a very new topic. So you need to still develop these type of operational tools to do these analysis. So, so and politics works with and civil servants work with under a lot of pressure, but they need very concrete tools and support from scientists on how, how do we do in three months 
uh, a cost effectiveness and analysis on the objectives of a climate adaptation plan. So these are kind of very practical challenges that they face. Uh, and also look at evidence gaps. So if there's a, a mosaic of evidence, uh, commission reports and others that have been you know, conducted by the drafters or, or ordered by the drafters, is there something missing? Those, so the scientific team can know the latest scientific research developments and they can flag those as well. So that's the kind of things that we've been working on. And, um, and next slide, please. So we, the, here are the kind of topics. We started with one ministry and we've scaled up to seven now. So um, it tells something about our early successes, I believe that uh, we actually, when we started with one ministry, we have gotten calls from six different ministries simply saying the good word has been passed around, that you're doing something that is of value to the drafters and others have wanted to be part of those processes as well. Uh, we got about nine to 10 on both sides from the scientists and from the policy drafters about the user experiences in these cases. So I think there's a lot of satisfaction as well on both sides about the engagement as well. So uh, at least that level also, we believe that we have had early successes. Um, the work still continues and uh, we're trying to analyze that also even trying to understand what we're doing right. That's sometimes not easy as well. So we get satisfaction from both sides, but then we try to understand what is it that we're getting done here, you know. And so um, the work continues and I think we've gotten early successes, but, um, but yeah, happy to be introducing it to you. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Jakko. So uh, I, I was wondering, uh, because you've, you've been talking about the, the, the team, the composition of the team. And uh, we've been also talking a lot yesterday about the trust and, and uh, accountability and transparency of uh, the science advice and so on. So I, so I wonder how you guys actually select firstly the, the group and then are your results of your work somehow then openly published or, or communicated to the wider audience? Yeah, so so very good question and, and very important. So obviously, you know, we have certain formal criteria to begin with, like gender. We also want to push for kind of intergenerational groups. So we want young scientists to be part of it because we think of, of the long term as well. So even if the young scientists don't necessarily know, have the best available knowledge, we think long term and we need to educate them and get them part and understand policymaking as well. So that's that's really important. Uh, then obviously, you know, the, the, the Finnish Academy of Science and Letters supports a very kind of rigorous scientific, um, you know, ethic and ethos. So, so we're, but we're staying away from uh, scientists from the industry um, in, our, in our cases. So we're not using, uh, you know, uh, lobbyist researchers, etc. cetera. Um, then I think the multidisciplinarity is important. And we also, we hear the ministries because in here, it's not necessarily as much of a problem as it sometimes is in expert panels because uh, when civil servants are, uh, are in, involved, they are much more often uh, interested in the kind of best possible expertise to support their work. Because then when they go to the politicians, mm -hmm. that will be the, the kind of next discussion. Plus also, I think in this type of context, there's the, uh, yesterday there was talks about activist scientists. In these type of cases, it's not necessarily as problematic as there are activist scientists involved because you have the proposal and then you start to test the tenacity of it. So even like narrowly framed scientific views can be important there. So even if you don't look at the overall big picture of evidence. But, but do you guys then publish firstly the methodology, oh, yeah. how you select people yeah, and then yeah. methodology, uh, how the process happened yeah, of creation? Yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. And then the, uh, and as you asked, the outcome is uh, we they are available publicly. So usually the scientific group comes up with conclusions, uh, the main findings about the process uh, and give certain recommendations for the civil servants about how to proceed to provide the proposal uh, to be more evidence informed. And those opinions are then published. Right, right. Uh, so we have one question from the uh, from online. So uh, I will ask that. So uh, Gabi uh, Umba is asking, uh, what type of training did you provide to public officials engaged to introduce the red team foresight methodology? So uh, they they don't necessarily need that much because what we are the expert brokers. So I think one of the key parts of the whole process is to have expert knowledge brokers or science brokers as we call them as well in Finland. So, um, so we actually 
develop, build the whole process. So my background is also in, in a governance consultancy and I'm an academic as well. And what I've realized there is the importance of having someone to build the whole process from the beginning until the end and also try to understand the, the needs of the civil servants because sometimes even they do not know what they're actually needing because they're too close to the topic of, uh, of you know, what they're working. So actually, first you try to identify the needs with civil servants, uh, then you, know, you analyze with them the documentation that is then passed on mm -hmm. to, the, to the science teams. So we analyze and try to say like, no, you need more, much more. You need much more uh, for you to get to the results of where you're going. So it's largely on you as well to kind of navigate the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And also facilitate the workshops and so forth. So. Uh, we have a lot of questions from the audience. I don't know who was first, so I'm very sorry. Uh, Thank you, I'll be quick. Uh, my name is Ana Elorza, and um, I would like to ask you about this process in the legislative power. Have you worked with MPs, with members of parliament in Finland, or it's just in the executive power? Thank you. In the, in the executive power, yes. Um, I'm Annalena Kleskulik from the European University Association, and I would be interested in whether you have made the experience that then at the political level, the proposals that kind of come out of your process are somewhat taken more seriously. Are you more effectful than with traditional science advice? That would be interesting. So, so actually, sometimes what we also identify is that because the civil servants want kind of, uh, they want some uh, like support, leverage when they go to politicians with their policy proposals, they want leverage from evidence that is then created by the red team. So actually that's what we are sometimes try to identify. We try to identify with the, the drafters political pain points uh, that they can already identify early on. These are topics which will be controversial. So let's work on those with the team. And so maybe from the evidence, then they will get some leverage onwards. Obviously, there's some things that are already excluded from it. So they can be like, there's a political party in power, uh, you know, the demolishing uh, subsidies in uh, neutralizing, carbon neutralizing transport. And then they say like, we can't touch that. We know it's controversial in the light of evidence. Some things are ring fenced out of it as well. All right. Yeah. Thank you. I'm David Peterson from uh, Copenhagen. So first of all, congratulations with uh, securing the uh, permanent funding. That's uh, really an accomplishment. Uh, and as you know, we are also trying to achieve some of the same uh, sort of uh, mechanisms in, in Denmark, in, in, in Copenhagen. So I was curious about the, uh, the feasibility study. You mentioned that you did more than 300 interviews in the beginning of the process. And I think that has probably been quite crucial also for the later outcomes. Yeah. How was the reaction uh, by the senior uh, policy actors when being interviewed? What were the sort of my main findings in those interviews? Just well, there's various, a lot of findings, obviously, but a lot of things like we found exactly the, the dissatisfaction in the current kind of, you know, mechanisms, yeah. uh, the limited Q&A logic, that was one, so the fragmented mosaic of evidence that they will get, and quite often, even the commission report doesn't deliver satisfactorily, uh, necessarily. We got a lot of, you know, uh, the, the usual stuff about time pressures, about, you know, the two communities, cultural differences, and, and, and the, the uh, you know, the scientists coming too far from the, the, you know, the fundamentals and assumptions. And for example, that we realized, okay, if scientists come a lot to do with fundamentals, then we, we realized we can tackle that with boundary objects. So the policy drafts are actually boundary objects that are bringing the two communities much closer to each other. And, the, the, and it's a very common way for scientists to work on just reading a draft and then commenting it right so it's a very usual way for us to work so so we realized okay this works because when we did that just openly there was an open question about it uh, the topic scientists would go all around and and then the civil servants would be like mm, we didn't find that very useful in the end so things like that but it was just a lot to do with like also learning by doing and then getting a feedback loop and then iterating and iterating and building so and Due to the lack of time, we will have to cut it short now. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you for your attention. Think, and yeah. you're always welcome to be in touch. And, and next slide. So thank you. So yeah. there's my email as well. <laughs> Thanks a lot, thank you. Yaka. And now we move on to the third uh, case study. And then Vincent will be chairing that part. Yes. I'll be very brief. Good morning, everyone. My name is Vincent Guinness. I'm a professor of mathematics and complex systems here in Brussels, but here today I'm more a member of the Young Academy of uh, Belgium, where we are interested in innovations in science advice. That being said, I'm introducing here today Peter de Smet, 
who is from the Department of the Chancellery and Foreign Office from the Flemish government. He's going to talk to us about agile use of evidence in times of crisis. Thank you, Vincent. So yes, I will touch upon four uh, issues on the agile use of evidence in times of crisis. Um, next. So the first thing, why? Eh? Why in a crisis do we need evidence? Because we have seen a lot of uh, emergencies. It was really, COVID uh, put a lot of pressure and the focus was very much on action. So why in a period like that, should we take time, resources to build up evidence? Another thing, um, signs of the times. What did we observe? Eh? Because as a public service, and, and servant, um, we were very much within um, the, the, the response. And it was also good to have this session now to have a little bit uh, a broader look on what we learned about it. And then I will give you some information on a, on a case eh, on the Flanders recovery plan. And I will take you to some forward look uh, for the next de decade to come. Next, please. So what happened? Um, we know public policies as more or less a kind of stable set of, um, of actions from government. And that's quite important to understand. Um, the stability is also something that the public stakeholders industry is, is looking for, is, is hoping to find from government. So it's not about um, uh, surprise. It's really about to be trustworthy, to be to create a kind of stable environment, regulatory environment, where all the stakeholders can do their things. And then, what if eh, what if a global pandemic? Then of course it set pressure on the the, the actions, eh, the public policies that were available, and we saw in the beginning a lot of very confusing messages, communication about the pandemic. I remember myself in February, um, we got some early insights that uh, for Europe, it will be okay. It will be like more or less like the flu. Uh, we can deal with it. We saw it in the past. And then we saw a rising um, amount of cases and it was really exponential. And then of course, your, your current set of policies aren't working anymore, but then what then? Next, please. And what is important also is how do we know in the times of crisis what work and keeping in mind that um, in the field of policy analysis, there's a lot of examples of policies and policy measures that haven't been underpinned and therefore are often kind of um, not targeting or not delivering uh, the objectives that have been designed for. So it's really important, even in the times of crisis, to take some time and to try to understand what is happening and what kind of measures are really helpful. Next, please. And our uh, insights is that at that moment, you can not only wait on all the best uh, or all the, the, the evidence needed, you have to make um, use of the best available knowledge. And that includes issues on warnings. Um, I, I've, I've uh, put here the, the, the curve, and I think that was a very successful way to um, provide some, some, some information to society that if we do not do anything, it goes really fast. It goes exponential, and we will all be impacted. And what was also interesting to see is that um, scientists have been put forward to communicate this kind of information. And it was really interesting because it's quite a specific kind of information and um, we weren't used to communicate with data, but we saw that happening. And we saw also that these kind of concepts and, and the, 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 the warning like we need to flatten the curve was helpful, was providing kind of guiding people to stick to the measures. Next, please. And how this kind of information, these insights have been uh, created. We saw a lot of initiatives um, at different levels, local, national, European, worldwide. Um, we saw policymakers and, um, and, and, and uh, scientists working together 
And I think that's a clear message. Science advice is not about being in a silo. It's not only about being an instrument. It's about creating an environment, an ecosystem where evidence can flow. Why is that needed? Eh, we needed a lot of support for kind of very early um, measures, actions, and fast tracking the evidence that is available. Eh, the science policy interface is a very useful concept on to do that. And why is that so important? It's not only about the direct needs, but also to anticipate on a longer time scale. This morning in the session on climate change, that was uh, also an important uh, issue mentioned. Uh, everybody uh, works with different time scales, science, policy making. And it's not that science is always slow and policymakers are always fast. It's both, eh? because also sometimes policy initiatives take some time to develop, to, to design, to test. So it's on both sides that we need to connect the different processes different on different timescales. And the science policy interface is a useful concept to do that. Next, please. So this is the, the, the second part. Eh? What, what did we observe um, during the last two years? And in a way, and it was not a surprise, uh, but it was not easy. We took shelter. Eh? Um, there was a lot of uncertainty around us. It was really urgent. We saw a lot of um, an anxiety and we took shelter. Uh, we saw that happening everywhere and on different issues. It was about how we could keep on our social contact because we're not, we were not allowed anymore to go outside. So we did it digitally. It was also to do about how we work, how we learned. And you saw that uh, at schools, all levels from primary to uh, higher uh, education. It was also about um, keep on track on our health uh, by staying at home. Um, we were kind of limited on, on getting our exercise and things like that. And we saw uh, uh, a lot of, of these apps being developed and being used by people. It was also about how we participated in society, in the economy and also in politics. Next, please. And on this figure, you can see what happened. And indeed, eh, this is uh, some data from, from Flanders. Uh, it has been produced by IMEC. It's a, a large institute in, in, in Flanders, in Leuven. And they have been monitoring what was happening. And you can see that, that indeed, it was not only taking shelter, but it was also being more active uh, at several levels in the digital society. Next, please. And um, this year, there was also an interesting publication in Nature um, that was focusing on the lessons learned, eh? because it was not only about being more active, but there was also more data and the data wizards and data tools being uh, available for the people. And um, in, the, in the paper, there were three key messages. Eh? What did we learn about the, um, the data wizards? because we saw an abundant uh, amount of data being available. And the three lessons were is that it's important um, that the data is available. Uh, and in the beginning, you saw that, eh? that um, uh, we knew there was a lot of sources, but they were not always in the same standards. They were not always easily available. And by gradually by, by uh, in 2020, we saw more and more initiatives to really make the data available and to try to make them in a format that they are used uh, or could be used in these uh, dashboards. The second element, and that's also linked with the graph that, I've, that I have shown, is that um, you do not only have to communicate with the data, but also try to educate the people how to understand the data. Uh, data and the graphs will only work if people really understand how it works. And then the third lesson was, uh, it's also about trust and transparency so that people know how the data have been produced and uh, that they can trust it. Next, please. The case, uh, that's the third uh, uh, part of my presentation. So we had a plan uh, to deal with the crisis uh, that was the Flemish resilience plan. Uh, next. 
And uh, one of the key issues that we try to do is really to streamline uh, the evidence flows. Um, we created uh, expert communities and it, you can see it as a kind of multidisciplinary science policy interface. Um, we communicated with data. We made a resilient dashboard. Uh, next, please. And we also opted, and I think that's quite important and it's uh, linking with uh, transparency and trust. Eh? We opted for the progress reporting to create open data and to make them available. And um, we are still at its working progress. Uh, we already had three uh, progress reporting phases. We are preparing the next one. And we are not only trying to get an understanding on how the, the, the projects are um, doing, but also to learn from the progress. And we use a, a system perspective approach to do that. Next, please. And then the fourth element of my presentation, a forward look, what can we expect in the future? Um, next, please. And there's an interesting initiative from the European Commission. They put forward a digital compass where you can see how the changes in society, especially in the dynamics, how people, business, uh, governments are evolving in the, in the digital sphere. Next, please. And one of the challenges that is coming out of that is that um, we have now more data than ever. So we need to change the way that we use data and uh, kind of separating signal from noise becomes more and more important because there will be a, um, uh, an, an over availability of data. And you have some interesting approaches to do that. They're coming from, from um, from climate uh, models that have been used in economic and financial modeling. Next, please. And in a way, what you do is to, uh, to anticipate the difference in, 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 in time and in, in scale from indicators. You bring them all together and you try to find a kind of common, um, a common factor. Right? So what is going on? So even if your data is not always uh, the most recent, by combining several data, you get a kind of general overview of what is happening. And with Hinsight, it has been used also to better understand why in 2008 and 2009, the signals that were out there were not uh, being taken up um, to really understand we are, we are getting into a financial crisis. We need to have measures now. Next, please. Next, please. Sorry. Next, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so that's quite important to do that. And an interesting, uh, this year there was also an interesting uh, paper from um, the science service of the European Parliament is that, um, can we use machines to do that? And what does it mean? Um, I, will, I will finish my talk here. Um, next, please. So I've touched upon the four issues, why um, evidence, even in times of crisis, is important. What did we saw during the crisis? I gave you some brief insights on a case study in Flanders, and I provided you with some outlook for the decade to come. Next, please. And then I would thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, for this interesting insight. Um, well, the floor is open for questions. Yes. Thank you very much for the presentation, super interesting. And I wonder how did you manage uncertainty when you communicate about all these complex yeah. things in times of crisis? Yeah, um, this was one of the reasons why we started to uh, communicate also with data to really highlight using certain uh, indicators that it's not a static uh, environment. So there's changes. And one of the issues uh, was the labor market. So in the beginning, of course, you saw a huge shock, but um, already last year uh, in Belgium, we saw that um, there was um, uh, kind of the business was taking up. Eh? So economy was getting out of the crisis. And um, there was a need for uh, people to help them uh, to, to get started in the, in the labor market. 
and the dynamics were quite quite tense. So business uh, has a difficulty to find the right people, and and so in a way, uh, a part of the uncertainty about the recovery is by using data, using graphs, and just informing people. It's something dynamic. We cannot uh, forecast or we cannot uh, predict how it will go, but we can communicate the dynamics. And in a way, that's a way to anticipate uh, uncertainty. Thank you. I see that online a question came in that relates to this. The question comes from Gabi. Is horizon scanning part of your strategy, complementary to the now scanning? Yeah. Um, now yes. Now. Yes, it is. And, and also on that, uh, at this moment, we are, we are trying to find how we can use artificial intelligence to help us with that, because that's also part of um, to differentiate between noise and signal. There's, there's so much information out there. Like 10 years ago, you could more or less get out. I take uh, select uh, some very specific indicators and data to follow up. With the abundance of information now, it's, it's like mission impossible. And we hope to, to, to make use of, um, of, of tools and, and digital algorithms to help us with that. So yes, it's part of our strategy. Um, hopefully in the near future, I can present some uh, insights and lessons learned from that. Okay, wonderful. I don't see any further questions from the audience. So let us thank Peter and all the speakers again. And that summarizes the first part of this workshop. The second part is going to be slightly different, uh, different from what we traditionally do the, in these kind of conferences, because we are going to stretch the legs and we're going to move around. Uh, this is going to be a positions game. And I'm, I will immediately explain you how it works, but perhaps it's also good to introduce very quickly uh, the pressures that we're going to talk about. Like the title of this workshop relates to pressure and science advice. And well, we identified many different types of pressures that exist in science advice. We already heard a few of them um, yesterday and today on the conference. Some of them relate to well, the fact that we have unclear situations, some of them relate to the fact that we have lack of time, some of them relate to the fact that there are biases on researchers and policymakers. And then finally, there's also the lack of trust or the pressure that comes from the lack of trust between the society and the policymakers and the scientists. So what we're going to do here today is we are going to make a little bit of room in the middle of the, uh, in the, middle of the room here. And we are going to separate the room in two parts. One part will be assigned to one position that you can take, uh, and the other side will relate to another part. Let us quickly make some space here. Let's try to keep this momentum. Um, so this position game essentially is not a scientific um, question that we're trying to answer. It is rather a way to get the arguments shared and to get people talking to each other, as is happening already in the back of the room right there. So we are going to read a couple of questions. We won't have time to go through all the questions, uh, but we're going to ask you to go on one side or the other side of the room, depending on the question. So let me Repeat, this is not um, a scientific study. We're not going to see this as some kind of uh, average of position that you're taking. On the other hand, we want to open up the debate and have everyone share their views. And also it gives a very visual way of seeing what the, what the people in the audience here are believing. Um, another thing that I would have to say is that as we are taking position, I will give well, the floor to some of you uh, asking why are you standing here and not there. And that also allows all the other ones in the room to update their position. If you hear an argument that you think like, wow, this is a good argument, I didn't think of this, or I didn't interpret the question like this, then obviously you can update your position in that way, which is probably how society works, right? Um, so the final disclaimer is that this is perhaps the one time in your life where sitting quiet in the corner might imply that you're taking very extreme positions. So <laughs> please, <laughs> please participate. It is in your own uh, well-being to do so. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's good to start with. Ah, yes, there's also an online opportunity. Thank you, Wim. 
uh, an online opportunity to uh, participate. So there's this gem board, the link should be shared in the chat. So you can go there, you can make um, a small sticky note with your name on it and then uh, put it on the side of the spectrum where you think you belong or where you think you want to belong. It's the very first time that we're doing this positions game hybridly. So I'm not sure this will work, but it's a very good experiment. I see there's a question. Oh, that happens all the time. <laughs> but there is, a, there is a middle. Keep it COVID safe. Uh, so don't go and stand everywhere on, on, on the same location. But I'm, I'm sure that things will uh, turn out well. So is it OK to start with the first question? Yes, great. The first question is more of a, um, it's not yet a position question, but it's more like a question to know who is in the audience. And the first question is, how do you identify yourself more as a researcher or as a policymaker? So I suggest that if you identify more as a researcher, you go and stand on this side of the room. If you identify more as a policymaker, you go and stand on the other side of the room. Um, extremist here, right? Extremist <laughs> policymakers here and extremist researchers <laughs> at the door. Look at that. <laughs> It's already very crowded in the center here. So this is probably not one of those questions where it makes a lot of sense to ask, why did you take this position? Because it's probably just um, the, the reality or at least how you perceive yourselves. But okay, it seems that everyone knows how things are going because I see that most of you moved. Uh, that's good. So that's uh, how we can start with the first question. Uh, the first question is related to time pressure. Uh, and it goes as follows. Should researchers give science advice to policymakers if there is no thorough scientific consensus yet? So during the process, and there's a lot of uncertainty still, should researchers already give science advice or should they say like, I'm sorry, there's just too many vagueness. I cannot give any advice yet. Um, so if you think that they should, please go and stand on the left side of the room. If you think they shouldn't, you should go and stand on the right side of the room. <laughs> Small updates. Unfortunately, there's nobody here. Uh, otherwise, this person would have had the opportunity to share first, but perhaps a very brief one. It seems that most of you are on the same side. So um, anyone who Ah, okay, I see that also online, most people are Centrum, yes, I would say. Um, is there anyone who has like a very specific argument why they should constantly do this, despite the fact that scientifically there is no real evidence yet? Or should we call it then scientific evidence if there is no enough of it there? I mean, um, that was the constant companion in the past two years. I mean, uh, we basically never had enough evidence that we could really with full uh, confidence advise. So uh, sometimes we had a bit more than, than at other times, but uh, um, what we recognized at one point is that, I mean, uh, you know, the politicians, they have to go forward, no matter if we say something or not. And then better to uh, uh, see what are reasonable assumptions. And that is what we then uh, uh, worked with or scenarios. And that is uh, how, we, how we sort of try to bridge the time uh, uh, until there is evidence. Interesting. Yes, I see that one of the colleagues wants to add. I think it's also part of the uh, genuine communication that you should do towards the public. And it helps maybe to also raise awareness of the fact that uncertainty is part of the scientific process uh, and that all the time evolves. So um, if you then just say, it doesn't mean you give advice in the sense you should do this or this, but you just say there is not enough evidence to support this I or see. this direction. Okay, I saw that. Call it evidence-based advice. There is no, no evidence. <laughs> I see that. Yeah, yeah. I see that someone in the back. Um, I would. I would still say it's evidence-based. Um, I would say it's being transparent. I think it's uh, crucial to communicate the quality of the evidence. Why is there no evidence? Like in COVID, there were very good reasons why there was no evidence. Explicate the good reasons, say where science is heading. Um, 
another way is to say, well, this is bargain or garbage research. You can ignore it. That looks promising. It looks promising. So um, I think that's the role. You can't expect policymakers to take on the role of a scientist, but your role is to explicate what's known, what's not known, and where the, the disagreements are. So yes, it's evidence-based. Okay, great. Ah. Hey, just that. I think it's also useful to know what we don't know. So if you kind of being humble, yes. we don't know. We don't know how COVID was two years ago. Uh, and then we don't, we know it's, so it's useful yes. and actionable research to know that you don't know something. That's beautiful. <laughs> One more, perhaps, yes. I think that the IPCC reports, how they manage uncertainty, are wonderful examples because you can see the evolution. Like at the beginning, there was a little amount of certainty and what we don't know yet. And now there is a total uh, certainty, et cetera. And the time frame is not the same because the climate crisis is longer term than the COVID. But I think it's wonderful how they manage. And um, yeah, we can use the same approach in faster crises such as COVID. Okay, very, very shortly, <laughs> because we have many questions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's part of the roadmap. Um, so it's good to, to uh, from in the start, say we know quite limited, but we're working on that. So also communicating that you're working on that is also a good message. Okay, great. Second question, also related to time pressure, although slightly different. Should researchers give science advice to policymakers if it builds only on a, a limited quantity of so, uh, scientific or societal perspectives? So if not enough stakeholders were involved or not enough scientific disciplines were in, uh, involved. So some disciplines already have a lot of evidence, but not all of them, not the consensus is, has emerged yet. Should you, I presume that most of you are already standing there, but <laughs> let's reopen the floor. Um, should you or should you not give advice so so i think in the in the moment of crisis that's clear because we say we don't have time right and then we have to do it what about if we have climate it takes years right we are like we had years of research and so on and then can we allow ourselves as uh, researchers or should we rather strive for actually uh, saying no in the places like climate where we kind of had time before we need to look for uh, for the different stakeholders. We need to look for the views. So do you think it's fine not to include that views in the mm, situations where we have a climate and not necessarily the COVID or, or you think it's, so here people saying, yes, it's fine. If we just do it on our own here, we think it's important that we have a different stakeholders views. <laughs> well, you have to be transparent about it. Yeah. Uh, and what are the reasons why you didn't include them? And also, I think the stakeholder inclusion is, is also part of the political process that may come afterwards as well, not only part of the research as such. So, yeah, sure. But you have to, that's you have what you have to tell about the method you used. And it's, again, part of the way you communicate. So if you tell, if you explain the method, but say, yes, my method is that I do not include because this and that, is that... <laughs> no, I think it's the same, uh, similar as before. You have to say where you are right now, and then you say, well, there is more to do. Uh, but I think uh, just wait until you have everything and not saying nothing in between. That I think is not an option. Uh, but I think uh, what we said before, the transparency uh, to say, well, uh, actually, these views are still missing and we need to include them. And the, the conclusion might be different once we have these uh, uh, included, I think, is part of the of the process. In my view. Yes, but following COVID situation, if we just listen to the ep epidemiologists and the, and the doctors, we will still be at home. You see, and it's very important to understand that maybe social scientists were crucial here from the beginning. And uh, I don't know, I think that you really need to have the right people in uh, at the same table before you start saying anything. So for me, it would be really a no, not saying maybe not anything, but it's really incomplete and it's not the whole picture. So. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, I think that, um, yes, they should start giving advice and they should also uh, get involved in fostering deliberation within the scientific community. If, they have, uh, if the policymakers haven't assembled a multidisciplinary team, they should be the ones reaching out to other uh, learned societies and academies and not uh, staying just as epidemiologists, giving a highly technocratic and corporative uh, uh, perspective, but they should engage in the process. Uh, it's not, uh, I stay back until a multidisciplinary team or I engage with everyone. This already touches upon one of the following questions, but there's another comment. Just a brief comment. I think we need um, constant dialogue, uh, regardless of the time pressure. And uh, that's the problem when we arrive and it's already too late, we need to build the trust constantly and also educate the policymakers what is our way of working and understand also ourselves their way of working so that we are able also to give the right information. Yes. Okay. I saw that. Yeah. Ah. Yes. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I think it's also important here to mention that um, the question about um, disciplinary diversity or cognitive diversity is not really the responsibility of the researcher. It's the responsibility, as Lorenzo said, of the policy institution. Interesting. Uh, to, this is uh, our next question. Right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but that shows that the chronology of the questions is good, right? Um, but uh, I, I know where you're going to stand on the next question. <laughs> it's still ah, at the wall. Yes, at the extreme. What are, wait, wait, wait. Um, you think that it is okay to yes. explain the thing to uh, still just don't consider other like stakeholders? Of course it is. <laughs> of course it is. One is, it sounds so easy to say, let's base it on a wide range of disciplines. Come on, how are we going to balance that? I'm a social scientist and I belong to the group that. I mean, I wrote about it. Why aren't you inviting sociologists or psychologists to the table? I wrote about that. But then the response of many is, okay, but what, what is your evidence? Well, we could say, yes, the lockdown is increasing inequality. It was increasing gender inequality. It was increasing inequality in families. But what solutions do we have immediately? So it also tells us again, to not only identify problems, which we're really good at as science, social scientists, but also work towards solutions. But that doesn't mean we should not engage with policymakers. We have to talk about where we come from, what our perspective is. And yes, somewhere, um, and I'm not sure where that takes place because it hasn't been done very much, there has to be that weighing of the different portions of evidence. And I think okay. that's something that we all have to work. That I think that's something we really have to work on. That brings us to the next question. Um, also, I saw that online, the um, contributors hacked their way into communicating their position as well. So not just <laughs> writing their name, but it's really nice to see that they also uh, add to the conversation. For instance, Anna saying that the framing of the evidence is critical. Okay, next question. It was already solved or answered by you. This is not a yes, no question. This is a researcher versus policymaker question. The question is, who decides if science advice encompasses enough scientific perspectives? And well, whether that consensus has been reached. Is it researchers, you go and stand on the left, or is it the policymakers who decide this, and then you go and stand on the right? So who is responsible for knowing whether there is this enough scientific perspectives and that all the voices have been heard scientifically. Um, so, yes, I knew that you were going to say. So policymakers on the right, scientists on the left. Yes, so, so I do believe that it is the responsibility of the policymakers to convene the right group of experts and to really keep an eye on the multidisciplinary nature of the advice, we, we know from studies that uh, it enhances the quality of science advice when you get different, uh, if not competing, then at least overlapping or diverging uh, types of advice uh, and types of evidence on the table. 
So at any given point in time, I think this must be the responsibility of the policymaker. Otherwise, to say no to be invited to an advisory committee just because we haven't covered all disciplines would make it difficult in the first place at all to be a scientist. So uh, we need to convey that message. And I think what was said by colleagues before that the COVID-19 pandemic have shown the value of multidisciplinary advice, really inviting different uh, disciplines on board has um, made a huge difference. Okay. Um, yes, perhaps center voices. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a shared responsibility. Obviously, they've got the, uh, the democratic mandate to assemble that uh, multidisciplinary team, but it's also the responsibility of scientific societies and scientific uh, scientists to gather and assemble those multidisciplinary teams, even if they haven't been asked to do so. Because uh, and we've seen in countries with very strong uh, science advice mechanisms that shadow science advice has been very efficient as well to put it in the public sphere and to so I, I think it's a shared responsibility and it's the easiest thing to say no no it's your fault you haven't done it. Uh, when yeah, I was just a position marker, so I'm not here in position, but um, yes, it's a shared responsibility and I agree with that, but I'm from the side of the civil service and we were organizing, setting up groups of researchers working together. And then suddenly I was asked as a government, I was held responsible that researchers weren't cooperating and I was asked to create more cooperation between researchers who are actually had their offices in the same hallway in the university. But just because they were in different disciplines, in different research projects, they almost, I, I don't blame them, there's, there's too little time pressure, uh, too little time to do everything, but then to ask me as a government organizing policy research to make researchers cooperate, yeah, we should of course make it possible and, and see that there's time and money and, and, and that the people are in contact and that we select multi, uh, multidisciplinary teams but actually to make them work together, if they're in the same hallway, uh, I think there's something wrong with that. Sorry. Um, yeah. um, I, I agree that it should be a shared, um, shared responsibility, but I think that it's also a question of um, a bit of competence because I, I believe that probably most policymakers would go, what does the science say? And then the scientists go, what do you mean the science? Well, medical doctors in COVID, for example, say one thing, epidemiologists say another thing, then uh, sociologists, psychologists say yet another thing. Uh, maybe you include, uh, include economists and then probably some say one thing and then some others say the complete opposite. And so the, 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 the question should be, or the, the interpretation of uh, what is solid evidence, who do we include? Uh, it should probably not lie with the policymakers because I don't believe that they have the competence or the time to really dive into that. And mm -hmm. so I'm a little bit more on the, I, I, th I agree that it should be shared, but I'm a little bit more on the researcher side. So I will allow myself to read something online. So I think there are quite a few opinions which support what you said. And then there is like uh, someone saying that institutional science advice bodies, for example, are the good, the good place to decide if there is enough or not and who should be involved. Someone is saying here that uh, it touches on the who is, oh, no, I have, it has been covered, the other one, so I can't read it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that this should be a, a part of public deliberation at policymaking stage where gaps are identified. Uh, that's, uh, Gabi has mentioned that. And uh, someone is saying that researchers and advisors can highlight what issues have uh, scarce evidence, but highlight them, uh, when even scars, ah, uh, highlight them even as scars, uh, yeah, there is a sound evidence. So, one more sentence. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> so, I'm standing in the center because I sort of agree with both sides. I think scientists should be responsible for engaging with their fellow scientists who are working in dis different disciplines, but they sometimes need to be encouraged to do that. So I'm with the European Geosciences Union and we have 22 different scientific divisions and they're all scientists and they're all geoscientists and we have a conference all together, um, but there's still this division between people very much like, oh, I'm, a, I'm an astrophysicist and no, no, I'm an ocean scientist and I belong over here. 
And we're gradually moving towards having these interdisciplinary sessions and having interdisciplinary working groups and things like that. But it is, you have to push people. Um, yeah, so I think it's both sides. I was, I'm more Yes, on, oh, sorry, oops. go ahead. Oh, what, please. So we have an extreme policy, extreme, or relatively extreme for our group. So <laughs> we agree to disagree, okay? But, uh, we are going to disagree, <laughs> so go ahead. <laughs> Uh, no, I think that's a, a, a clear, um, it was said also during the plenary, it's important to have a clear mandate for researchers. Are you there speaking on your own, representing the institution you belong to, the discipline you belong to? Are you speaking only the projects you did because you don't like the person that is in the, uh, the other professors that is sitting next door uh, and uh, so, so you're presenting only your view or you're asked to go and make a review of all the uh, all the evidence that is available. So this should be also clarified on the policymaker side. What is your mandate? Are you speaking as an individual and then an, clearly a qualified uh, individual that has a lot of scientific experience or you're there to represent and we ask you to make a review of all the available uh, uh, scientific to present your institution uh, and so on. So I, I think that should be strong clarity in the mandate that is asked uh, before asking an advice, what is your mandate? And I think that's the IPCC can be taken as a good example. The only thing I want to say is that, of course, the world is not perfect and you have these silos in the scientific community, but go to the civil, to the civil administration and see the silos you have. The Ministry of uh, Ecological Transition will not talk to the Ministry of Health. The Ministry of Health will not talk to the Ministry of Science. So you have exactly the same situation in your side of the room. <laughs> what I'm saying, <laughs> of course, come on guys. What I'm saying is if we know, if, if, if we the scientists need to point out who is missing in the table is we. If I can say as a scientist with, very clarity, we need a mathematician here, we need a sociologist here, we need whatever, and they don't know what we need. So who is studying complex systems? The scientists, not the policymakers. My point is, of course, we have to talk to each other, but who is the one having the competences to know what is missing is us, and then we can work together. So don't talk about silos because there's silos everywhere. <laughs> Okay, I feel like the boogeyman uh, having to stop this uh, dynamic debate here, but we still have four more questions and 10 more minutes, so we will have to cut a little bit. Um, I will skip one question to go to the last three more polarizing questions, I think. One of them we already heard this morning. Um, should, well, we wanted to have a question about biases, but we were, of course, aware of the fact that everyone has a bias, and therefore it is difficult to ask should scientists be biased or something like that? So we rephrased that question into should paid lobbyists, people who are being paid to have biases, be part of the scientific advice process or cycle? We already heard an opinion about that this morning. Um, so if you think that they should be a part of the cycle, the paid lobbyists, you go and stand on the left side. If you think they shouldn't be part of the cycle, you go and stand on the right side. Just being a part of, not the only person to do that. So this is, where, where is the part no, being a part the no, no is there yes, yes is here yeah i know no is there sorry for the confusion there's it's a it's a mirror yeah um, so interesting a lot of people who are center voices are center voices for many questions but <laughs> and the same for the extreme voices uh let's let's uh hear someone on the left first why they should be part of the cycle I mean, it says the same as with everything. They have to be there, but also, I mean, politicians, scientists need to be aware that they are there because they're paid and they have some interests. Maybe the interests of those companies, I mean, they should also be taken into account. Then it will be a politician who assessed by the scientists to say, oh, they're saying this because of these reasons. And then find a middle ground, taking into account their opinion and also waiting it, waiting it according to their interests. Yes. But they should be, I mean, listened to. Although, of course, the waiting is already a difficult problem, right? Uh, perhaps a center voice? I'm a bit divided because I think they should be part of the policy making process, of the broader consultation process, but should they be part of the science advice? I don't know. I think that's a different question. 
<laughs> no, well, response. we did it in practice. Um, some of the best researchers work in the auto industry or work in the plastics industry. Why? Because they don't have to teach, they don't have to run after grants. <laughs> so it would, and it's crucial that whatever information they provide is openly accessible so that it can be um, perused, that it can be evaluated. It cannot be something that's only available to an inner group. Then it should not be used. And another, and that's the point you made, is it's crucial to identify conflict of interests. And even researchers have conflict of interest because I've, you know, I've invested in something in 40 years. And, but so yes, um, a, a plurality of views can be very useful. Let's hear on the other side. I see two voices so, here. Just one comment. I wanted to say that two people uh, who, or most of the people expressing it online are actually saying rather not, at least not in the anal analysis part. Maybe it will change later. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think, of course, they should be given an, uh, an opportunity to express their, their opinions. And I think uh, uh, also what we discussed earlier, of course, in balancing, uh, it should be taken into account, but there has to be a red line for the scientists and the scientific advice where we say, no, this is how far we can go. And uh, we had uh, this ample experience in the advice for, for, for instance, COVID measures on airplanes. Of course, the airlines had a completely different opinion than us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we said, well, okay, if this should be a joint document, this is how far we can go. And if you want, don't want this, we actually, we actually pull out of this. Um, and then the sort of that was, was uh, where, where it was, it's very clear, you have to communicate the red line. Okay. Yes, there's, there's movers in the room, but I can see- Can I ask something to Jaco? Because uh, before you said that you will not take into account, if I understood well, uh, the, and, and we are working in the, in the National Congress in Spain and we're doing the same, is a public lobby for the public, public for the public. And I was wondering how can you be on the other side of the room? <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if someone would notice. Uh, but yeah, so uh, basically with our model, because we, we work with, uh, uh, basically it's a closed dialogue. And I think there, uh, the selection of expert is even more crucial. And I think that there's a difference between uh, you know, exactly what people have said before as well, consultations with uh, the experts from industry. And then the, for example, the core group of scientists who are then you know making the synthesis and providing the final advice i think yeah <laughs> <laughs> so the final, the final advice yes i think so but okay it's okay. true we have a mover here <laughs> I, I would like to single out peter because he is a mover There's so a mover. <laughs> No, the point is that we should make use of the best available knowledge. And, and I'm convinced also that uh, private uh, paid research has also its value as long as you're quite clear. And I, I fully agree that uh, by including them, um, it, it, it will enhance the transparency on that body of evidence. Uh, so that's why I moved uh, fully to the yes. Interesting. Okay, one more, but yeah. we have still two more questions. Just one read. Gabi also says that uh, agree, but as you guys mentioned, we should just explain clearly what is their biases, what is this interest, and then we uh, we can do that. No, I would I would just add that that you can say what you want to say, but uh, a hallmark of science advice is independence. And you can, of course, invite people from different <laughs> backgrounds, but there cannot be dependent paid lobbyists within a scientific advisory mechanism. It's not possible. But, but watch out. There was a Mark, Mark, Mark Ferguson yesterday said, independence is overrated. Mark Ferguson said that yesterday. I'm not saying this. I'm just provoking here the thoughts. <laughs> as, it, as it goes with fireworks, the bouquet is coming in the end, as you can tell. Um, we have... One more, okay. But... <laughs> <laughs> I use this because I 
Good evening, scientists. Uh, my name is Angelos Karlaftis, EPAFOS advisor. We represent here the ECOWAVES movement, the pan European and Mediterranean regional movement, which is based in direct democracy, in arts and ecology, and one of the third pillars is science. So I'll put the same question I put on the urban uh, uh, gathering next door. Uh, who, uh, they didn't answer, maybe you can answer, <laughs> because uh, um, what we, we want to achieve is the society of knowledge so that uh, as many citizens in the local or in national levels, they can reach the knowledge, not through internet, uh, but through a live uh, human uh, participatory way. So uh, if the scientists, as I told, are transmitting to the citizens their influences from the financial institutions, then how this can be delivered to the, to the simple citizen uh, who wants to participate, he, see, he is mistrusting the scientific uh, knowledge. So the independence, of course, there is no existing independence in this world, but uh, uh, the scientific uh, uh, autonomous way, not independence, autonomous way of thinking uh, is dependent from the scientists themselves. What do you say about that? Thank you very much. It's interesting. It's like on an exam where a student answers a question with a question. So we're, we're, answering, <laughs> we're answering questions here on, on both sides, but your question relates to the question that we're going to answer now. So please participate. Um, <laughs> so, so this question relates to the question how scientists should publicly behave when they are giving science advice. And we might have seen this in the last couple of years where scientists are actually fighting with the policymakers publicly in terms where they actually gave science advice before. Uh, and the question is, in, specifically in topics related to collective action, is it a good thing? Doesn't it undermine the trust? Is it a good thing where scientists publicly speak out on something against the policy that has been taken? So if you think, yes. Yes, it's after. good that they actually Yes, it's good do. that they do this. Yes. yes. No, it's not good because it undermines collective action and it undermines the trust in the in the policy making. <laughs> that are involved. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, I, was, well, I was half talking to myself then. Um, <laughs> I think, <laughs> no, I think it depends if they're the ones who are actually giving, working with the policymakers, or if they're an independent scientist who has a different, who would like a different opinion to be considered. If they were involved in the process, I would lean towards no. And if they're not, I'd lean towards yes. I see. But if they are involved, you would go no. Involved, yes. <laughs> but for me, if you see the American example and you're Dr. Fauci, what do you do? I mean, you have a responsibility, even if you're involved in the process and you see that some crazy guy saying that you must drink uh, whatever toxic product, you have to do something. So it's a responsibility as a scientist. For me, you have to, if you get involved, you get involved. Maybe you have to resign at one point, <laughs> but you cannot go from there without saying what you think is scientific evidence. But then it's still good to talk in the room, right? Maybe at one point you cannot stay in the room, but what you cannot allow is that your scientific advice is completely twisted, you know? So maybe after that, you have to resign, but you have to fight for what you are standing. And this is my opinion. If you take so the public trust and collective action into account, perhaps? No, I, I, I think this is the question that I decided also for myself very early on in 2020, that uh, whatever comes in those coming period, I didn't know it's, it, it's, it will take so long, uh, that I will um, stand true to my own values as a scientist. Uh, and that means that I can't argue in public something else that I argue with a policymaker. So I cannot give policymakers uh, an advice and then argue differently in public. That I think a, a, a scientist cannot do. But I think we, we need to, to uh, be true to ourselves to say, well, this is uh, very be open to a policymaker, even if they don't want to hear it. And I said, as I said to myself, if they fire me, they fire me. But what do you think? I know that you shouldn't be saying one thing here, one thing here. But how about just abstaining from doing it publicly if you do it in the so that's a, I understand conflict yes, but abstaining in like no, we have a here two voices. Yeah, for me it's a, I, I agree with you quite a lot because it's like betraying your values. If you don't speak out, you can do either uh, um, 
on private or in public, but you cannot be be quiet. You you need to to yeah give value to your beliefs. Uh, with the scientists, uh, uh, we don't have an argue. We don't uh, have a conflict with anybody. We have to be a little bit in a latency way. We have to be slow and say to the guys who are coming to argue or to have a conflict with us, wait a moment, uh, sir or lady, I'll come back with evidence. Because whatever is the theme of discussion, we have to find the evidence when we are scientists. Because the scientist is a researcher of truth, nothing else. And the researcher of truth with the experimentation uh, uh, accordingly, uh, he, is, uh, he must be slow and not fast as the system today wants us to be in the new transition. We have to be slow to understand better and to have a dialogue. This is the word, dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Can, can we just read ah, yes. maybe here also from sorry message just from no, no. online so that so Gabi is also uh, participating here Rudiger and Linnea says agree uh, uh, that they are allowed Gabi says uh, it is not about arguing but presenting evidence uh, and they should present the state of the art in their respective uh, discipline and political decisions are those of political actors I think what it aims here is again about the roles saying scientists uh, is just presenting the evidence shouldn't take the role. But we heard yesterday, someone was saying, if you speak up publicly, you as a scientist already pick up the political role. So that's something I think, which is interesting to keep in mind. Um, also from a policymaker perspective, uh, if we give also advice to policymakers and sometimes we get ignored and you also sometimes have very extreme politicians. You can have very extreme politicians above you. And then I heard, yeah, but then you should they leave the honor to yourself and resign. But what if all between brackets reasonable scientists do that? Then there's no voice of reason, even if it's not heard, but then there's even no supply of a little bit of reason to those people. Also, from a policy from policymaker perspective, as you get parties that you don't really like or standing points that you don't really like, but there's no one actually contradicting them again, and they end up in their own echo chambers. What happens then? I see movers. <laughs> that means good arguments. I mean, you're not in a in a sort of. Isolation. Yeah, isolation. I mean, it's not only researchers and policymakers, there is still media, journalists, uh, pub different publics who may have a, a reaction to exactly that. So I think you have to consider that too. Okay, two, two or three final, final, final mm -hmm. comments. No, I was going to say that your strength is transparency as a science advisor. Whatever you do, you publish that. Even for the UK case in SAGE uh, committee, they were, it's a very nice setup, arch architectural setup of science advice. I was impressed many, many years ag uh, ago with Robin Grimes telling, them, telling us about this before COVID and before everything. But they fail in, in publishing their reports and you need transparency. Once you have given advice, that should be open to the public. Then the politician can make the decision. I, we all agree with that. It's not our role. But please publish what we have said. Okay. That's the only thing I'm Two saying. Two final words. Additionally, uh, I mean, the transparency process and the participatory process. Sometimes policymakers cannot strictly follow the evidence uh, a scientific advisor is presented simply because the society is not ready for, that, uh, for those options. So you need to engage publicly. The, pol the policy has been taken in this direction. My advice has been taken into account, but I haven't been able to convince the policy, uh, the politician to, to take this, uh, this thing because of A, B, and C. As the microphone moves from there to here rapidly. I think I, I want to underscore what you're saying. We're talking now about the scientists, but I also say if the policymaker does not take my scientific advice into consideration, the policymaker should say I had other reasons exactly. and that's something that is lacking okay someone who moved perhaps that's a good way to end yeah, this discussion. it remind me the, the the movie don't look up that you may have all watched uh, during Christmas time because at the end the guy DiCaprio leaves the room 
because he's not listened and it keeps the government doing any bullshit. So maybe we need to stick and keep our voice loud, even if we don't like what we, we hear in the room. On that positive note, it's 11.18. I thank you all. <laughs> and I thank also the online moderators. This was very bright. Yeah, yeah.